Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to people in the room uh, around this huge roundtable um, at the end of the day. Um, my name is Maria Manojlovic, and I'm the director of Safe Online. Uh, this event is uh, called Safe, uh, Safe Digital Futures, Aligning the Global Agendas. Um, I want to welcome uh, participants online as well. Uh, and if you're joining us online, please, uh, we have an online moderator, my colleague uh, Natalie Shoup. Uh, so please drop in the chat quickly where you're joining us from, and feel free to drop in the questions throughout the session. We will be monitoring the chat and making sure that we can respond to your, to your questions. Um, as I said, my name is Maria. I lead the work on Safe Online as the part of the End Violence Global Partnership. Um, we, are the only, uh, safe on, we are the only global fund focused on safety of children uh, issues online. We fund system strengthening uh, across uh, different sectors. We fund research and data, and we fund technology tools that are looking into tackling harms and risks to children in digital environments. So far, we have invested around $100 million, $100 million in over 100 projects, making impact in over 85 countries. So through this work, we interact with a wide variety of players and stakeholders from various sectors and fields of engagement. We interact with governments, private sector, and industry. Uh, we work with uh, child protection organizations, with civil society organizations, um, as, well as, as well as industry uh, and academia. And through that engagement, uh, we, are realizing, we have realized one thing, and this is the reason why we have organized this session today on the alignment of various digital agendas, which is that there is alarming level of fragmentation in this ecosystem, which is truly hampering progress in many aspects. Uh, but in particular, when it comes to safety of children, children are too often left aside and not even considered in the discussion on digital governance and development. Uh, so some of the common reactions when you work in this field are the following. We have had literally people turn their backs on us when we mention children in our interactions in relation to online issues. They would say, well, we work on infrastructure or protocols, or we work on connectivity or access, but we really don't deal with kids. Our engagement is focused only on women and girls. Sorry, we can't really speak about kids more broadly. Or we just work on human rights more broadly, but kids are not really part of that. Um, or we really just care about education. Education is really critical in access, but you know, safety is not that um, critical for, for what we do. But somehow placing children and safety in the overall global agenda on digital development and human rights has been particularly hard. Um, then there is the famous privacy and safety dichotomy. Um, you know, the tension between, between how do you assure privacy of users at the same time ensuring that users can, and not only you, I mean, I, I actually hate the term users, it's humans and people. Like users, like it's not, it's not some like other category of like uh, um, creatures roaming around. Um, so when we think about, we think about privacy and safety, we need to be thinking more broadly about how do they interact at the level of humans. But when you speak about prevention and response to online child sexual exploitation and abuse, that's even more harsh uh, distinction. So you will find, if you find yourself at the end of the spectrum who cares about online safety, uh, you will end up being accused of various things, like the latest really fancy thing that we've been accused of is that we are trying to end privacy online, which sounds really cool. Um, but but it's, it's just, it's unbelievable. So that the, we believe that this dichotomy is really false, and we believe that more nuanced conversations are needed. Uh, we believe that we should not be forced into choosing which one matters more, and when, uh, uh, when we know that we can and should have both. So um, as we were discussing this yesterday with Maria Ressa and Justina Ardern was saying, you can and should have both, and this should not be a matter of choice that we should be making, uh, uh, and sometimes having much more deep and upstream discussions is going to be needed for us to be, to be, to be making some, some nuanced and meaningful contributions in that regard. So now that I have vented and complained a lot, let me be more positive. Um, what are the causes of this misalignment? And I believe there are a few things that we can, we can think about, but in order to advance the state of the internet, which is beneficial for humans, and in order to maximize the benefits of digital technologies, we have to invest efforts to understand where these misalignments come from um, and how we can overcome them so that we are in fact more aligned and more impactful. Um, that is why I believe that the most important, this is the most important discussion that we can have. And in order to do that, I want to ask you uh, to do a couple of things. First one is let's move more upstream. Instead of focusing on manifestations of the issues in these various fields, like technology facilitated GBV or gender-based uh, uh, violence, lack of connectivity and access, cybercrime, and so on, to actually upstream design infrastructure and policy choices 
that enable these things. We are repeatedly seeing that the driving forces in engagement techniques behind radicalization, violent extremism, political extremism, misogyny, child sexual exploitation and abuse are very similar, both from societal and Norse perspective, as well as from the technological point of view, in terms of how the design choices, choices of digital platforms are enabling these phenomena, and how not only they're enabling them, making them worse and exacerbating them. Second thing that I want to ask you to do today is share learnings and failings openly. Not only what has worked and succeeded, but what has not in your previous engagements, so we can do better. You will hear a lot from our speakers today about that, but also speak about solutions and approaches that work, uh, work across the landscape. How to engage with governments, how do you create political will, will it, what will it take to do that? How do you engage with industry and create incentive for more action? Accountability and transparency will be critical. So today we have brought a lot of speakers, eight speakers and experts from various fields to help us frame this discussion. We will not make them speak all at once, so don't be scared. We will, I will introduce them throughout the session, but we want to make session as interactive as possible. So we're going to split the session in three segments. We're going to have speakers introduce for five minutes their kind of catalyzing, catalyzing, igniting uh, remarks. And then we will open the floor for discussion. We have, we have asked people, and again, asking people to please come, come to the table if you, if you want to join us at the round table. But also people online, please drop in your questions um, uh, 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 in the chat and we're gonna be making sure that you can participate. Um, for all of those online, yes, please get engaged. And finally, um, there's a huge diversity of perspectives and expertise in the room. So please be respectful uh, when you speak. And this is a safe space for people to express their opinions. For people who are new to this field of online child sexual exploitation and abuse, there may be some sensitive things said here and some triggering facts. So uh, we're just giving some warning to you. Be, 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 take care of yourself. If people need to step out, please step out at some point. And then again, be mindful that we all want to speak. Uh, so please keep your remarks concise and focused. And with that, let's dive in. So the first uh, segment we're going to talk about today, uh, we have labeled cybersecurity and online safety, but again, these are such fluid agendas, and uh, you will see how we are going to try to unpack all of that. I will kick off with my question to uh, Ambassador for Digital Affairs, André Verdier from, from France. Um, and what we want to do is see how various agendas around cybersecurity uh, um, and online safety interact around issues of child online safety. So, Andri, in many ways, we spoke this morning as well, but you basically sit at the intersection of um, this issue that you want to discuss today. You are someone who has worked in private sector, public sector. You have worked in academia, you have worked on digital commons, you have worked on counterterrorism. You have been one of the instrumental people leading on the Christchurch call from French, French side, but also on the Paris call for cybersecurity. Um, and most recently, and that's how we started interacting, you've been leading the work on Child Online Protection Lab. So as somebody who is wearing literally like 15 hats, can you tell us a little bit more about, from the global perspective, but also French perspective, how do you see all of these issues aligning and what have you learned throughout these engagements and uh, what are the opportunities and challenges around these potential uh, uh, um, efforts to, to make these things more, more, more aligned? Over to you. Wow, in five minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to exchange with uh, such a, a panel. Um, yes, as you said, uh, we, we try, uh, like our friends of the US, for example, to, to build a, a global and coherent digital diplomacy because uh, everything is interconnected and you can start from cybersecurity or education or else. At the end of the day, <laughs> you have to, to be coherent. And since I'm the first speaker, probably you, all of you will say the same, but let's recognize that internet is something great, even for children, that they have access to more knowledge, more entertainment, more communities, more empowerment than ever. And that something is disbalanced now. <laughs> so first we have the, some troubles with the cyberspace itself with the dark web uh, which is a very efficient tools tool for uh, criminal activities we did commoditize a lot of things like payment or um, taking a room or so which is very efficient for a lot of businesses even for crime business we have big companies that um, that are very very big, monopolistic, and why not? But sometimes they have um, 
unexpected uh, negative externalities from their business model. And for example, uh, we can observe fil bu filter bubble or eco chambers or radicalization. And, uh, and regarding all of this, we have to, to find solutions that does respect the promises of internet. That's, that's the first point. And for this, we, yes, I was thinking this morning during another panel, 30 years ago, John Perry Barlow did write the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace. Because at this time, we could consider cyberspace as something external to the society. There were a place somewhere named the cyberspace. Today, we could say cyberspace did eat the world. <laughs> so it did contaminate and transform uh, everything. And so to, to start to answer to your question, the, we have two principles for our diplomacy. First, everything that is forbid, forbidden in real life should be forbidden online. And everything that is guaranteed in real life should be guaranteed online. So freedom of speech. So we have to forbid what, that's what is forbidden and to protect that what should be protected. That seems very simple, but we all remember how difficult it was to implement. For example, when I go to, to New York to discuss in the UN about international law in the cyberspace, we are speaking about few very simple laws, like Geneva uh, Convention, or, but we, we did discuss during 25 years <laughs> to, to be sure that we do understand in the same way how we will apply the UN Charter or the Geneva Convention in the, in, within a conflict, which is, this is just one topic. So this idea that seems simple is not so simple to implement. But the second thing is that we, government, we didn't build those, this system. We, don't, we understand how it, did, it does work. I, I, I'm an entrepreneur, I did create three internet companies, uh, small, but uh, I understand, but I don't build it. I, don't, I did never see the, the, the algorithms themselves. I don't accept, accede to the source code. So the companies, and the, of course, civil society and researchers, but the companies has to be part of the solution. So we need not even a multi-stakeholder approach, but an efficient multi-stakeholder approach which cannot just be a room where we discuss <laughs> politely. We need to, to put the pressure, we need to ask for results, we need to, everyone in the room has uh, responsibilities and prerogatives, uh, and sometimes a business model or a mandate, but we, we, have not, we don't have any other way. We need to be sure that we, we will find a solution all together and that the companies will contribute to, to find the solutions. Here I'm, I'm speaking generally about terrorism, uh, harassment, uh, gender balance, and, uh, and child protection. If we go to child protection, wh what I did learn in this journey is that this is a very difficult topic, maybe one of the most difficult. First, as you say, this is very difficult to engage the conversation on those issues. People don't want to recognize that, I don't know, in France, for example, 25% uh, of children less than 10 years did accede to pornographic content. That's a big problem. <laughs> and we know that 20% uh, of the adults did, uh, were victim of some kind of uh, uh, sexual offense in their life. So that's one person out of five. <laughs> so people don't really want to recognize this because it, it would conduce them to change a lot of things. And we could recognize that there is much less money in this field than, for example, in the fight against terrorist content. You have, regarding terrorist content, you have strong organization, you have a lot of technologies, you have a lot of money. Or, let's mention this, if you want to, let's, you, all of us, we could try, if you try to publish a small part of a Hollywood movie online, in 10 minutes it will be removed <laughs> because Hollywood did finance solutions to, to detect this and to intervene very fastly, very quickly. So this is a, a weaker field with less money and um, I'm too long? <laughs> okay, I finish. Um, 
with a wide range of uh, issues, and that's the second thing, because everyone agrees to protect children, but here we can speak about strong and uh, heavy criminality, like um, human trafficking or whatever you can imagine, uh, child abuse, or, but you can go to, to uh, harassment, online harassment, you can, uh, so something lawful but harmful, but you can even speak about um, the consequences of some algorithm regarding the, the way you observe your body, for example, and are there connection between some over-representation of some pictures on anorexia. So, and we should uh, pay attention to this. So th this is a wide range of topics, very um, impressive, not the same level of heaviness, if I may. So I, I will conclude and we'll continue, uh, but you, you did ask for a um, uh, project from something more positive. As you know very well, we are trying to launch um, the Child Online Protection Lab. The idea here is to build evidences all together in a cooperation spirit between companies, civil society organizations, research, and governments, because I feel that that's one part of the issue. This is a very ideological conversation. Everyone say, we should <laughs> make this or this or this, and no one tests, no one experiments, no one shares the results. So for example, and I finish with this, if we just speak about age verification, so which should be normal, you, you should be able to test the, the age of someone pretending to go to a pornographic website, but you have dozens of approaches and some of them are better for privacy, others are more efficient, others are centralized, decentralized, etc. So we, we need to, 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 to to see the details and to test and to implement and to share the results. That's one approach France will encourage deeply during the next years. Thank you. Thank you, Henri. And I, and I like really the, the focus that you put on evidence and data that can really help us bridge these debates, but also bring, bring back home the actual work on solutions, not only state the level of principles. And I think that's something that we can also jointly think about as the, one of the ecosystem pushes to be more evidence focused and more data informed in, in our discussions and experiment more cross-sectorally as well. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, so moving on from, from, from this kind of a very global and, and, and interesting uh, um, um, initial uh, um, um, well, intervention, I would like to move to Dr. Albert from, from Ghana. Dr. Albert is the uh, Secretary General of the Cybersecurity Authority of Ghana. Um, and Ghana is really unique in, in many ways, but one of the ways that we really are particularly interested in is that it is a unique example in the world where issues of child online protections have been streamlined fully into the work on cybersecurity at the national level. Um, you are Director of the Cybersecurity Authority, um, and you have been at the center of those developments. Right. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about what were the key factors leading to this outcome? The fact that you've managed to, to institutionalize child owner protection as part of your cybersecurity work. What's the political will, the ripeness of the issue, right. uh, public attention, institutional setting, legislation. What, what were kind of the key, key driving forces behind, behind that? Correct. In five minutes, thank you. Uh, certainly, thank you. <laughs> uh, first of all, a pleasant afternoon to, to my colleagues here, uh, participants, but also uh, our colleagues who have joined virtually. Uh, Maria, I want to thank you on behalf of my government for the invitation, but not just that. Uh, the support your institution and violence against children has uh, rendered to us over the last few years. Uh, you're right, I think I've been around for a while. For the past six years, I've been leading Ghana cyber development uh, as a national advisor and, and then as director general of the agents responsible for cyber street development. You are right, a, a number of competing factors there. Uh, there's a national security interest, of course, the issue of terrorism, cyber terrorism comes up. There's a private sector interest, uh, issue of protecting critical information infrastructure, the intelligence aspect of cyber, uh, the civil society, academic part, but you can't take away the critical concerns around children. So I think at a national level, uh, one would expect to have a 360 degree about some of this development. And I think we've achieved some, some successes when we started this processes. Ghana cyber city readiness, uh, according to the IT ranking, was around 32.6%. That was the middle of 2017. 
as at the end of 2020, uh, Ghana's rating jumped to 86.6, basically university cycle from F to, to A. And, and a number of things have been done. Permit me to highlight some of this. I think one approach we also adopted, um, of course, the political commitment is key. I think I'm, I keep on telling my colleagues, I'm lucky to be running Ghana Cyber City because I have the support of my government. Uh, my minister runs when she, she's presented uh, with a sound uh, policy or approach no matter. We don't delay. Of course, my government, is, the president is also committed to that. So I think within the past six years, it's been quite a cited journey, uh, notwithstanding the challenges, including financial challenges. But we, we had a unique approach uh, in terms of uh, based on this approach on data, research is key. Um, we had to conduct research before this process. Two reference. Uh, we worked with UNICEF in 2017 uh, to look at opportunities, but also risks uh, of children. And interesting dynamics. On one hand, which we all know, there's a trend in which children are using uh, internet and devices. And consequently, uh, we established that four out of 10 children had also had contact with inappropriate sexual content. So on one hand, you have a positive development with respect to opportunities for uh, children even in unserved and underserved communities using the internet. But on the other hand, you also have those uh, uh, disturbing training which uh, they are always coming into contact uh, with content that certainly had the potential to uh, impact on their well-being. We also had to do a research with the World Bank support uh, with Oxford University uh, and the cyber security capacity maturity model, which also highlighted the gaps around um, the protection of children. This research led to a number of uh, interventions. The first one was legislation. Ghana passed a cyber security act that incorporates uh, child online protection as uh, a whole division within my authority but also the law criminalizes certain sexual offenses. We're lucky to tackle what has become like the sextortion quickly uh, within our law. And it has had a lot of positive impacts uh, afterwards. Uh, of course, awareness creation also uh, was uh, put into legislation to make it mandatory for the state to lead that process. So that is one aspect of the institutionalization of, of uh, child online protection. But we had to also look at policy um, aspect of things. So we developed a child online protection framework uh, which incorporated a number of best practices uh, including the, the We Protect framework but also ITU guidelines that, that were provided and that were pretty um, important. As part of the institutionalization I've mentioned my, my uh, agency has the division for child online protection headed by a director, a very senior person. It's not just that through the work we did with UNICEF and support from uh, Maria Agency, we established a child online protection forensic lab, which was the first within the sub region, uh, also to help uh, investigative bodies in terms of forensic evidence uh, to support the work because uh, deterrence is key. Criminal justice response is also one of the areas that you need to look at it uh, as a national response mechanism. But most importantly, and this is where I think I draw a lot of uh, inspiration from, the institutional arrangement. Uh, certainly my experience, somebody needs to lead. You need a champion, but you need to carry people along. So different agencies, the gender ministry has a responsibility, education ministry, the civil society, the academia, uh, the, the uh, telecommunication service providers. So we needed to bring all these uh, actors together. And I think anybody who has visited us has seen we've achieved a lot of success, that there is a consensus on the table uh, uh, on the way forward to be able to uh, uh, address child online. The, the last two areas that we've also achieved success is incorporating awareness creation uh, around the, those risky areas and children into our national program. So Ghana launched what we call a safer digital campaign, and we came out with four pillars government, business, public, but also children. So specifically, the education, and this has been institutionalized. So you don't treat awareness creation around uh, the risks that children are facing as uh, a sub-team, no. And I think that is one area we've achieved a lot of success going uh, through the schools across the whole country, 
in terms of raising awareness with the, with the collaboration with UNICEF. The last one is also reporting. We need to empower the public with their children to report. Ghana, when you call 292, it's free. You can call that on a smart device or any other device free, and you can report uh, uh, incidents. And we've become lucky. This is just to conclude. Initially, when we set this national uh, hotline, we thought it was going to receive only incident. In other words, the citizens, children are going to report only after they have been well affected. No, it has changed. It's becoming more like a, a tool for them to seek guidance. So when they, they make a call, somebody says, send me your note, or click on this link, they're able to call. We advise encouraging them, please call 292 free. Don't pay anything, 24 hours and just at least conduct some minimum due diligence. And I think that has been, personally, as a public servant, the most uh, important deliverable, a service good for the Republic. And, and I think I really want to recommend that we, we, we look at those options as, as a best practice. But of course, there has been challenges. I wish we can speed up uh, in terms of awareness creation. Ghana is big, 32 million, not bigger like you, <laughs> places. But uh, I don't think I've been able to achieve my awareness creation mandate even 20%. I, I feel very uncomfortable. There's a huge gap, and, and I think um, we need to scale up our efforts. And the needs are there. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, I Albert. Hope, uh, you were really, yeah, it was really good. Um, I do want to say this morning when we talked about uh, um, working Ghana, one thing that really struck me was how you um, eloquently described, well, actually, your strategic intent behind immediately legislating. Because you wanted to remove this uncertainty around there is political will now, but there may not be next political cycle, right? So how do you immediately ensure that you institutionalize this thing and, and also create incentives for ecosystem ownership? So not only that it's you who has political will that leads on these things, but make everybody take the bit of the responsibility and accountability over it and create that ecosystem responsibility uh, uh, be shared. Um, so thank you for that. So Julie, um, I want to kind of get back to you now with um, your work is globally known. Uh, you are the first governmental regulator and independent agency focused on online safety. Uh, you've done tremendous work both for Australians but also global population and across. We use your resources all the time um, and they're really always the highest quality possible. Um, so eSafety is a regulator but also it's, uh, it's agency that works on prevention of various forms of, of crimes. Um, and you have wide range of powers and functions uh, which you try to apply really comprehensively. But what is interesting about your agency is that many people don't know that it started as only being focused on children. So it's kind of went from children to become everything else. And it's really then great to have you here to give us kind of a sense of like how, because it seems it was centered around kids, how do you see kids issues now being embedded in this, this broader risks and harms ecosystem, and what are some challenges and, and opportunities for us to make that, as you did, a very big and part of uh, a joint up effort? Over to you. That is a great and very hard question to encapsulate in five minutes, but um, uh, really it was, a, it was actually a political decision that it would be focused on children initially. Um, there was a, a well-known media personality who was open about her mental health struggles. She had a nervous breakdown. She was very active on Twitter. And um, I was interviewing for a role with Twitter to, to start their trust and safety and public policy uh, roles across uh, Southeast Asia, Australia, and New Zealand. And she tragically ended up taking her life. It became known as the Twitter suicide. And a petition started to government that just said, government, you need to step in and do something. This was in 2014. But because of concerns about freedom of expression, the ICT minister at the time, Malcolm Turnbull, who became the prime minister, said, we're going to start small with um, ch you know, children's e-safety, because nobody can argue that children aren't more vulnerable than adults. So he took a bunch of functions from a a across the government, um, put it into the Children's E-Safety Commissioner, and that included where the hotline for Australia, child sexual abuse material, taking reports on um, terrorist content, but also s set up the world's first youth cyberbullying scheme, um, where we serve as a safety net when the platforms 
um, fail or they miss cultural content and the, the seriously harassing, intimidating, humiliating uh, content targeting children doesn't come down. When I took the role in January 2017, I was asked to set up the revenge porn portal. I said, no, I'm not gonna call it revenge porn. Let's call it what it is, image-based abuse. Um, and for, for everyone. So that's, that's how that started, but I think it's really important to note that we take a vulnerability lens to everything we do, and nobody can argue, again, that children aren't the most vulnerable cohort online because the internet clearly was not made for children, although children make up one-third of the global internet users. And young people today don't differentiate between their online and offline lives. It is their playground, it is their schoolroom, it is their friendship circle. All that said, um, we had a very stunning um, glo uh, national research, the Australian Child Maltreatment Study, that found that a stunning 28.5% of Australians have experienced sexual abuse by the time they're 18. So that's more than one in four. And so beyond thinking about it as an online issue or an individual issue, which is why we take down comment content because it's re-traumatizing, but the comorbidities that exist that follow a child throughout their entire life, uh, they're more likely to experience sexual assault later in life, to be in um, family and domestic violence situations, to have drug and alcohol dependencies, to have serious mental health and suicidal ideation and also to become sex offenders themselves. So we need to think about this in terms of the long-term societal costs as well. And did you know that our Canadian counterparts found that 20% of survivors are recognized on the street for the child sexual abuse series that they've been seen in? So, uh, you know, you can imagine how traumatizing that is. So when we have that debate about adult's privacy versus a child's dignity or a child's right to be free from online violence. I think, what about a child's right to privacy when they're being tortured and abused? We need to really rethink about how we rebalance um, this. So what have we done um, in just three broad areas to address this? Uh, we have these complaint schemes um, where we're taking trends analysis all the time. So. Um, we know that kids are actually coming to us younger reporting youth-based cyberbullying because when um, we were locked down, parents were much more permissive techno with technology. They were letting kids on TikTok and Instagram and Snap at eight or nine. So now we're getting reports of cyberbullying um, of kids. And this goes back to Henri's comment about age verification. We need the platforms doing a better job. Like, Eight and nine-year-olds have no business being on these platforms. Um, they don't have the cognitive ability to be able to address this. Um, so we do the fundamental research. We've got the programs. Uh, we know that 94% of Australian children have access to a digital device by the time they're four years old. So parents need to be the front lines of defense. We've got a program for under uh, for parents of under fives to be safe, to be kind, to make good choices, and to ask for help. And then when they get into the primary years, it's about the four hours of the digital age, respect, responsibility, digital resilience, and critical reasoning skills. Uh, we have youth advisory committees so that we can hear from young people about what is going to um, work for them, so we have them running our scroll campaign so it's authentic and it's resonating. We have them writing letters to big tech saying this is what we want from you. We want you to take abuse seriously. We want you to take action. We are your future customers, users, humans. Um, but then we, we, we also have uh, systemic and process powers where we're um, compelling more transparency from the major platforms on what they're actually doing to address child sexual exploitation and sexual extortion and harmful algorithms. And next week we'll have a major um, announcement and enforcement action. We'll be ha um, holding five more companies to account in this area. So the more that we can shine light on what is and isn't happening, the more um, we can you know, push safety standards up. And that goes to the whole idea of safety by design as well. 
Um, again, we can't have safety be an afterthought, uh, the welfare of children to be an afterthought. We really need to revolutionize the way that technology is developed with humans and safety at the core, uh, again, not after the damage has been done. We need to get ahead of technology changes um, so that we're anticipating the risks. We're never gonna get a hold of generative AI if we're not focusing the scrutiny on how the the data is chosen and it's trained, and if we wait till it's extricated out into the wild, we're going to be playing a huge game of whack a mole or whack a troll, as I like to say. There we go. Thank you, Julian, and thank you for always kind of grounding us back into the research and data that you collect and how you always try to think in terms of long term engagement, because engaging with kids as young as zero to five, we are building future for healthier engagements later on. And like from the pre prevention lens, that's really, really critical for prevention, because we are seeing that, again, perpetration is also starting to be you know, done earlier and earlier. And, and, and we keep on engaging with just a certain group of, of kids, which is, which is like adolescents, but no, 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 no engagement with, with, with younger generations. So, so, so thank you for that. I know that you and Dr. Arbel Albert will need to leave at some point, so I'm just gonna you know, give, that, give that heads up to people. Um, but with that, um, I'm, I'm gonna give um, the floor for anybody who wants to ask any question at this point in time after the first round of interventions. Um, if there are any questions or comments, uh, please now raise your hand and we can pass, pass you on the mic. Or if there is anything online that coming in, do you wanna? So is there anybody in the room who has uh, oh, there it is. There it is. There is one. I think you can use the mic over there. Yes, thank you. Hello, I'm Anna from Brazil. Um, we, uh, I work in the Alana Institute. It is a child rights organization, and we are part of the coordination team of the Brazilian uh, Coalition to End Violence. And I was, uh, uh, I was like, I would like to hear your thoughts about, uh, based on Inspire, uh, how can we draw some, some measures and practical measures to, to uh, and think about the priorities in, in this area? Is the law, is the design, or how can we think about uh, standards and to avoid the fragmentation and to implement all, all these new ideas that you were talking about. I'm looking at Julie, but anybody can pick up the, the mic, please. <laughs> um, I, th I think we all have, will co probably agree that self-regulation is no longer enough. Um, and this sounds strange coming from a regulator. I don't think purely regulation is going to be enough either. And that's why we take, have this 3P model with prevention, protection, and what I call proactive and systemic change. And that does mean um, working cooperatively with the industry to achieve outcomes. Uh, we have a 90% success rate in terms of getting cyberbullying content and image-based abuse down because we work informally and cooperatively with the networks. And that is the way we get that content taken down more quickly. Um, to sort of solve this issue as more governments are thinking about um, how, how they set up either their own independent regulatory authorities or how they start small if they don't have the political will, we've started the Global Online Safety Regulators Network. We now have uh, six members of the network. I'm gonna be calling you Dr. Albert soon. Uh, but we also have observers who don't yet have independent regulators um, who, can, who can learn from these models. Um, but please go to esafety.gov.au. We have a strategy. We have, we're trying to do as much capability and capacity building as we can. We were the only ones for a while doing it, trying to write the playbook as we go along, and we've made a lot of mistakes. We're happy to share those as well. But I don't feel like anybody needs to start from scratch, even if it means we've localized um, a lot of our materials into multiple languages, take it, use it, um, localize it in a way that, that, that helps, that works for you. We've gotta be in this together. None of us are safe until all of us are safe. Thank you so much, Julie. And Dr. Albert, do you wanna? Okay, just a quick one. Um, I, 
I, I felt the sentiment of my Brazilian colleague, especially when she used the word fragmentation. I think that's a reality. She's speaking from a contest. And I think I saw this when I was first appointed. Again, it is a problem because you see, this is what I call ad hoc. Ad hoc happens even in the non-governmental space. Ad hoc activities are happening in governmental state. I think that recognition is key for uh, effective response. So institutionalization means essentially you are taking some systematic <coughs> measures. What Ghana did, and I keep on my own experience from the development context, developmental contests. Um, again, there's a lot of things from, from our contest. You know, you are now starting to put the nursery structures in place. Champion is key. You need to have someone who drive to bring all this. Even the, in fact, in Ghana, I identify among the civil society institutions, I identify one of them which was quite active, very respected, and I use. So we did CSA and a institution, and we mobilized others around them. In government, we took that, but we had to carry um, uh, gender, ministry, children, education along. That was deliberate, intentional. Other countries haven't succeeded. I won't mention it's a struggle uh, and, and the power concentration. And I'm saying those are from the developmental context. They are real. And without being conscious and, and identify what I call champions in all sectors, uh, it's, it's likely to, to be a little bit problematic. You may still have the law. And I think some of my Western colleagues keep on sometimes you are surprised. But you have this law. It's been there, but nothing is working. In my context, the law is good, but frankly, getting people even to sit at the table can be a challenge. And that is why, really, I felt like, in terms of the Brazilian uh, situation, picking champions are wrong. Of course, the, the child online protection ecosystem uh, is a collection of different players. And I think the first start is to look at those who are quite active. They will drive them. They are respected within the ecosystem and they're able to mobilize others along them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Albert. And, and just one more note for Brazil. I know that you're a member of the We Protect Global Alliance as well. Thinking about the model national response is a framework that, one of the frameworks that you can use to start thinking and charting different areas of engagement and how that needs to be happening. But again, we'll be happy to chat with you afterwards as well. Um, um, I will excuse Dr. Albert and Julie who need to go to the next session. Uh, uh, with you. That went so fast. Yes, I know. Can I make a brief comment? Oh, okay. Ambassador, sorry. Thank you so oh, much. My name is Peter. Oh, you. Okay. No, sorry, I make a brief comment. I want to make this in front of you. So first, let's recall that a large part of um, the, the issues we are speaking about is not on social networks. It is uh, in the dark web, for example. If you want to buy a real-time video of a rape of a baby because it does occur, it's not on business companies, it's on the dark web. And here we need more policemen, more investment, more international cooperation, but this is not about company regulation. This is about fighting crime. Regarding company regulation, I understand the fact that it would be better to have a world with one common rules. But this is not what I call fragmentation. The fragmentation of internet is a fragmentation of the technical deep layer. We have to fight this. But we are democracies, we have the right to have proper rules, or we are not democracies anymore. And uh, we are not here to build a unique market for, few com for five companies. And I want to say there is another fragmentation, and that's very important. That's the fragmentation of the investment regarding trust and safety. Because most of those companies, and I can, we can understand why they do this, they do invest regarding their sales. So they do invest a lot on big markets, on much less on small markets. And it's, of course, especially in Africa, for example, they don't invest, invest a lot. And we should ask them, we could do this in this framework of the UN, to equalize a bit the investment and to, to take a small part of the investment on, in Europe or US to invest this in uh, Africa, for example, or Brazil, why not? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe first in the room and then we can do the online, but also we will need to move to the next segment as well. Um, but go ahead. Okay.
Okay, thank you. My name is Peter King. I'm from Liberia. I would like to thank my, the, uh, the NEC, NCA uh, boss from Ghana. I would like also, the question is an open question, but then I would like for him to help in terms of suggestions that has that can be of best practice for other countries like Liberia, who uh, we struggling to have a cybersecurity strategy laws to protect online. What are some of the I mean suggestions he think he can offer to African countries that are not at par at the level of how Ghana is moving with certain issues or tools that they are using to create awareness on cybersecurity issues. The reason is because we we're looking at inclusion and then a the level of progress. I was I'm thinking about uniformity. So I just want him and other panel member who can share some of these best practices or advice on how to actually streamline online protection and cyberbullying in our African context. You know, the European contest may be different at maybe four years in Europe. He, ha he has an idea about how to use the mobile phone in our African contest. He doesn't even know that that is it. So can we look at these dynamics and what are the best practices and suggestions for the national level, civil society tools that they can use, and also at the level of maybe even the security sector to combat these kind of issues? Thank you so much. With permission of you, Dr. Albert, I will put you in touch with in fact, I, I there you go. brought a card and you just, just a quick one because, because I'm being <laughs> moved how we do to things. another session. But um, a good thing is we are in touch with Liberia. I think a number of African countries have visited us and they keep on coming. We share the little we've achieved, I think we're sharing within the region. The only problem I've seen within the region is just fragmentation. So you have one ministry visiting you Others are hot, left out. That's why I was stressing the Brazilian situation. So there has been contact with a body in Liberia. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to really integrate the structures. But please, we will discuss. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, Natalie, has, do you want to move ahead or do you want to ask a question? One brief question from okay. online. So um, from Omar Farouk, a 17 year old from Bangladesh, passionate about child safety online, started Project Omna and working with local and international organizations um, like UNICEF Bangladesh, UN Tech Envoy, to tackle digital issues like cybersecurity, bullying, and privacy, um, not only in their country but globally. Um, given the rise of cyberbullying and privacy concerns for children, how can we strike a balance between protecting kids online and fostering innovation and economic growth in digital space? What strategies can be developed to create strong partnerships between government, businesses, civil society, um, ensuring child safety is top priority? So just pe perhaps speaking to that uh, balance between the economic growth and innovation piece along with child safety. So perhaps, Ambassador, if you don't mind speaking a little bit to that. Ambassador Verdier, do you want to take that one? We're kind of looking into you, trying to avoid the look. You're like... <laughs> That's the eternal question, the big question. Uh, as a former entrepreneur myself, I just want to say two things. First, so sometimes if you, don't, if you forbid something, you forbid it. So uh, it doesn't... Uh, that's not a problem of innovation. For example, I don't know, uh, a century ago, when we did forbid uh, child work, <laughs> private sector said, ah, we cannot work like this, etc. But finally, we did all adapt. So that's important. There is not always a contradiction between innovation and regulation. And some regulation can be tools for innovation, like, for example, a good standardization. It can be regulation and good for innovation. The second thing is that very often, people oppose um, for, so security and privacy and uh, innovation, for example. But very often, if we work a bit more, <laughs> we can find solution. But you have to take in consideration that you are looking for three goals, for example, security and safety and innovation. So probably your first idea won't be the good idea. You need to work a bit more but you can still find solutions. And that's why we need those multi efficient multi-stakeholders to, to work all together and find solutions. I could, I won't, but I could share dozens of examples on how we did a very fine-tune some good balances between all those goals. So it was not the first idea, but then we, we did find solutions. So. Thank you for that. And thank you for the question from Bangladesh. Um, I think one of the things that I think neatly ties into the next segment that I want to open now um, is that sometimes innovation ecosystem is 
not inclusive of people who need to be part of it because various reasons, including safety. So women becoming part of the innovation ecosystem was for a long time not an option because you know, they just didn't feel welcome in certain environments. So making sure that innovation is not separate from, from, from ensuring safety in various, in various uh, uh, environments. So now we want to move to a segment on gender-based violence and image-based abuse. Um, one of the key things that we really want to unpack right here is how can online child safety be better positioned as crucial to inclusive gender-balanced uh, digitization? And another thing that we always struggle with is how can more be done in prevention work to address common narratives and perception of these issues grounded in gender norms and better center survivors? Um, so with that, I will uh, um, introduce Kaylin. Kaylin, um, you're a senior advisor to the White House Gender Policy Council. You're working on the issues of technology-facilitated abuse and harms, um, and you've been involved in the development of some of the landmark principles, guidance, and coalitions in this space, including the Global Partnership of Action to Tackle Tech-Facilitated uh, GBV. Um, so how do you see convergence of these various agendas from the White House perspective, um, and uh, also from the perspective of the drivers of abuse, harassment, and other harms, and how do they intersect with child online safety and protection? Uh, huge question, but over to you for five minutes. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much, Maria, uh, for for that question, uh, and uh, to Maria, Natalie, uh, Safe Online for hosting this critical discussion um, that is really so important to be present at the Internet Governance Forum. Uh, as Maria mentioned, uh, I'm Kaylin Crockett. I am a senior advisor with the White House Gender Policy Council. I'm also director for military personnel and defense policy with the National Security Council. And for the past two plus years, I've coordinated the Biden-Harris administration's efforts to address sexual violence in the military and also to counter online harassment and abuse as a feature of our domestic and foreign policy. These two portfolios might seem really quite distinct, uh, but they actually share a lot in common and I think speak to the heart of our discussion today. And the first and foremost is that all forms of gender-based violence and interpersonal violence across the life course share root causes and common risk and protective factors that perpetuate and are driven by harmful social and gender norms. And they are some of the most underreported crimes and abuses because survivors are too often shamed, silenced, and made to feel invisible. This certainly has been true for survivors of sexual violence in the military, as well as for survivors of child sexual abuse. There are core values also that I think bind together the child online safety agenda with the ongoing work we must all do to promote a safe, secure, and inclusive digital ecosystem for all people but particularly for women and girls, children, and LGBTQ plus people. This really means three things, I think, in particular. Accountability, transparency, being survivor-centered with a gender lens, and of course, prevention. I'm really fortunate to work for an administration led by a president and vice president that have been lifelong champions to address gender-based violence and to stand with survivors. The administration really understands that the consequences and costs of gender-based violence impact, in addition to individual survivors, communities, and the ripple effects of gender-based violence and all forms of abuse are felt across our communities, our economies, and our countries. And it must be said in this conversation that women and girls from marginalized communities, including people of color, LGBTQI plus people, and individuals with disabilities, among others, are disproportionately impacted. And it's important to also be clear here, clear here excuse me, that online violence is violence. And it can result in dire consequences for victims, ranging from psychological distress, self-censorship, and decreased participation in political and civic life, to economic losses, increased self-harm, suicide, and forms of physical and sexual violence. During his campaign, President Biden made a commitment to convene a national task force to develop recommendations for federal and state governments, technology platforms, schools, and other public and private entities to prevent and address all forms of online harassment and abuse with a particular focus on tech-facilitated gender-based violence. 
And in June of 2022, the president issued a memorandum that established a White House task force to address online harassment and abuse, which I have had the fortune to coordinate. This is an interagency effort that I think really speaks to that ecosystem approach that other colleagues have raised. It is co-led by the Gender Policy Council and the National Security Council, uh, and involves uh, many diverse government departments and agencies from USAID to the Justice Department to Health and Human Services, uh, Homeland Security, and, and several others. And the senior representatives across the agencies that comprise the council, oh, sorry, the task force, uh, have met regularly with justice system practitioners, public health professionals, researchers, advocates, parents, youth, and importantly as well, partner governance, governments to identify best and promising practices, gather recommendations, and learn from lived experiences to inform a blueprint for action. The initial actions of which were previewed in an executive summary that the White House released this past March and will ultimately be fully captured in a public final report and blueprint of the task force that we're working on to compile towards the end of this year. And again, most importantly, we've met with survivors and especially youth who shared how experiences of online violence have disrupted their lives, impacting their well-being, their health, relationships, careers, and career aspirations. And while each of their stories is unique, they share common threads and lessons that inform the work of the task force, and they have outlined concrete, measurable actions, 60 and counting uh, so far, that federal agencies have committed to, uh, to address online harassment and abuse. And I know I'm uh, already over time, so I'll just briefly uh, mention the four pil pillars of the blueprint that are inherently multi-sectoral. Those are prevention, survivor support, accountability for both platforms and individual perpetrators of harm, and research. And as an administration, we're working uh, truly uh, across the whole of government. We've committed to updating and expanding resources to address gender-based violence online uh, and including child sexual exploitation. For example, uh, the Justice Department is dedicating an unprecedented amount of resources to address cyber crimes that particularly impact women and girls, including image-based sexual abuse. And we've also really recognized the outsized impacts and harms of online harassment and abuse on children and youth, including in May, Surgeon General issuing an advisory on youth mental health and social media, which uh, particularly emphasized the intersection of gender-based violence uh, and child sexual exploitation online. Uh, so uh, with that, I will look forward to sharing more in the uh, Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, thank you so much Kaylin, and, and, and thank you and the Biden administration for really taking such a strong lead and position on these issues because we, you know, as, as everybody has been saying, a majority of the, of, the, of the platforms and companies we speak about are based in U.S. and what U.S. does is really going to matter for a lot of the other people across the world. So we are really looking into you for, for, for action on this. Particularly, thank you and the team and everybody else in the Global Partnership also for making sure that we are not siloing the work on child online protection as well as the issues on gender-based uh, abuse and violence. Um, unfortunately, uh, um, uh, Andrea uh, Powell from the Panorama uh, Image-Based Abuse Program has not made it in time from the airport. So we will, uh, if she comes, we'll just include her in the discussion, but um, if not, we will, we will move ahead. I'll just open the floor for one uh, or two quick questions uh, or comments on this, and then if uh, there are none, uh, we will move ahead with, uh, with the next segment. I'll wait for a little bit. Natalie, is there anything online coming in or anybody in the room? Oh, there is. Yeah, please come on in. Hello, everyone. Uh, first, thanks for the great session. I'm really, really happy to be listening to you all. Uh, I'm Emanuela. I'm from Brazil as well. I work in Instituto Alana with Child Rights. And one question that I have when we talk about this theme of gender-based violence and also about child abuse and exploitation. In Brazil, we have high rates of uh, abuse that happen online, so uh, that happens 
at home. So I have two questions about this. The first is about supervision, uh, parental supervision tools. How can we balance this complicated debate when we have the supervision, but we also know that the violence can come from the family and this could be a risk for a child's right to information, a child's right to seek help, and how to do this in a practical way? And so this is my first question. And the second is that we also have a very conservative country. And when we talk about prevention measures like sexual education, this can be a tough, tough debate that raises a lot of different issues. So I would really like to hear you guys on approaches, on advocacy, on uh, this kind of prevention, prevention uh, strategies that we can use because of the maybe taboo that this team could evoke in more conservative countries. Thank you. Kaylin, over to you. Thank you so much for that question. And uh, as, as many of uh, the experts in this room are aware, um, the United States, we are a federalist country, so we have 50 uh, diverse states. Uh, and territories uh, as well as that. And so there are a multitude of approaches that have been coming up uh, across the states on how to address um, these issues. Uh, and so for the administration's perspective, we want to be really careful um, about balancing what you've said and, and recognizing those concerns, uh, given that um, parents may not always be inherently able to represent uh, or willing to represent the best interests of their children. And we always want to maximize options and support uh, for survivors of abuse at any age. Uh, so I, I think you know, it's a very timely question. And I think it's really important that in line with your second question, uh, we really take an evidence-informed approach. Uh, and really focus on prevention as well. Um, one of the areas uh, that we've continued to invest in uh, is through our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, really taking a public health approach uh, to recognizing the shared causes of violence across the lifespan. Uh, we have um, an analysis that the CDC has done called Connecting the Dots. Um, that I quite like because it, what it really does is it connects the dots between multiple forms of interpersonal violence from sexual violence, intimate partner violence, child abuse and neglect, uh, cyberbullying, uh, and so uh, youth violence, community-based violence. Uh, and so that's one area um, where we've seen promise, um, but of course with everything, resources are so important too. Um, and so the voice of civil society to really demand governments proportionally investing uh, in these problems is, is so critical. So thank you for your work. Thank you. Brief, yeah, of course. A brief comment. Of course there is a tendency everywhere, including in France, to say that th those are questions for uh, work, decadent, and, <laughs> and uh, very liberal people. But actually, no. Everything is connected, and I share your point. This is about violence, and maybe I, I can share two examples. First, within the Christchurch call, now we are speaking about algorithmic radicalization. Most of the terrorist attacks were done in Europe. I don't mention Israel, which is a different situation. But in the EU, most of the terrorist attacks we had to face were done by very young people with a role of the social network in the radicalization process. And most of the terrorist attacks we had in Europe were co coming from masculinist movement. N it was not uh, jihad or I don't know, it was masculinist people against LGBT or against... Uh, so everything, uh, all those issues are connected. And if you tr pretend to avoid uh, gender balance and gender protection, you will miss a large part of the other's fights. Thank you so much. This is exactly why this session exists, to make these links and make them really clear in everybody's, everybody's mind, but also in our ability to create policy and otherwise responses to, 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 these, to these phenomena. Andrea has made it. She literally just ran into the room, so she's still in time for her intervention and the same segment. So perfect timing, Andrea. I hope you have had a time to take a breath. Uh, so Andrea Powell is the director of the Image-Based Abuse uh, Initiative at Panorama Global. Um, in your work, you're building partnerships and mobilizing efforts to ensure that no one experiences the enduring trauma 
um, that results from image-based abuse and other types of online harm. Uh, we are very proud to be part of this coalition and your work and have been above all so impressed with how you've ensured that lived experiences, um, lived experience experts are essential part of this coalition. What I want to ask you is what opportunities do you see for better alignment between IPSA work, the image-based abuse, sexual uh, abuse work with online child protection, but also from your perspective, what have been some definitional and content-related issues, uh, as well as in terms of practical tools and best practices we can build between these two fields? So over to you. Thank you very much, and my apologies for being late. Very happy to be here with all of you. Again, I'm Andrea Powell, and I am the director for the Image-Based Sexual Violence Initiative housed at Panorama Global, and we most recently launched a new coalition, the Reclaim Coalition, that brings together over 50 stakeholders from 23 countries, most notably from civil society, academia, um, law policy, as well as lived experience experts, often called survivors. And what I mean in that context is not just individuals who've endured this ongoing trauma, but individuals who are active in the field of addressing image-based sexual violence. <clears throat> image-based sexual violence is a threat or the act of creating and sharing intimate images without someone's consent. It is a form of online sexual violence and a violation of privacy that disproportionately affects women and girls, LGBTQ+, and ind indigenous and BIPOC individuals. Anyone who deliberately views, shares, or recreates this non-consensual Im images is participating in a sex crime whose unique feature is that the abuse lives on long after it's over, growing in magnitude for the whole the world to see. When non-consensual imagery is shared over text messages, online forums, or posted in social media platforms, it can quickly reach a global audience via uploads to pornographic websites that do not or cannot reliably verify age of cons or consent. Those who are victimized live in a state of constant trauma and fear when their victimization may happen again. Will their parents find out? Will their friends, coworkers, college admission counselors, or future employers? It is never post-traumatic stress disorder because the trauma lives on continuously. This type of technology-facilitated gender-based violence is growing in global prevalence. There are over 3,000 websites online that purely are designed to host this non-consensual intimate videos and images reflecting a vast enabling environment that facilitates this form of abuse. And what we know from the survivors in the Reclaim Coalition is that younger and younger children are ever more being exposed to this form of violence. Those who are impacted, whether they are adults or children, frequently experience elevated levels of psychological distress, trauma, extreme and prolonged anxiety, and suicidal ideation. In the early stages of the formation of the coalition, we uncovered over 40 cases of children who've ended their life as a result of image-based sexual violence, often within 24 hours of their abuse, leaving their parents little to no time to intervene. As a woman who was, as a child, a victim of sexual violence. I chose not to reach out for help. I chose to live in silence. And I never thought that silence was a privilege. Yet the survivors who bravely advocate in the Reclaim Coalition did, never got a chance to make that choice. Their sexual assaults are there for all the world to see. And thus, this is a global problem. But there are, is hope, and there are global solutions. Many child victims of image-based sexual violence are adults when they discover their victimization. And many survivors who are now adults and are part of the Reclaim Coalition experience reputed abuse online every time they dare to advocate publicly on this issue. As a matter of fact, as I boarded this plane, I was working with an individual who just came out publicly and had all of her images re-uploaded to a site called Pornhub. This trauma does not stop on their 18th birthday. The very real harms do not go away. And abusers continue to share and re-upload more content. Leading up to the launch of the Reclaim Coalition, we hosted a private summit with lived experience experts from eight countries. What I thought was going to be an informative, well-agended program became a witnessing session where survivors shared their stories and created the formation for 17 recommendations that we shared with our colleagues, most notably at the Gender Policy Council, as well as forming the basis for our first landscape report, I Didn't Consent focusing and centering this issue around privacy and consent in an innovative way that eliminates the question of why was the image put up there? What was the intent of the abuser? Because in all reality, we don't ask domestic violence victims why their husband hit them. We don't need to ask online survivors of image-based sexual violence why their abuser abused them. 
I came up with five core areas of intervention that I think we can take lessons from the area of child protection and build upon this to look at this issue not as siloed intermittent interventions across children's spaces and adult spaces, but things that we can do across those divides. First, we need to build knowledge. The public misunderstands and lacks awareness about online sexual violence. Without knowledge, survivors don't know where to get help. Law enforcement don't know how to intervene. And frankly, the public misunderstands and continues to shame victims instead of the abusers. We need to harmonize global regulation and policies. The policies to address both child and adult online sexual violence can and should be more harmonized. This includes removing the barrier of proof of intent of the abuser, as well as classifying this as a serious sex crime. In fact, we should ensure that across the globe, the online sexual violence of children and adults, most, most affecting women and girls, is taken seriously and given the serious type of criminal penalties that offline sexual violence endures. We also need to standardize global hotline support to ensure that hotlines that address the adult abuse image-based sexual violence receive the same standardized global standards as does in the child space. There is an allied network that may have been brought up today called the InHope Network. It is a phenomenal network of, I believe, over 80 hotlines across the globe looking at child online sexual abuse. We need to do this in the adult space as well. We also need more tech accountability. Those 3,000 websites that I mentioned earlier could simply be de-indexed and go away. So why haven't they been? There needs to be an opportunity for tech to engage in a proactive intervention way with civil society, learning from lived experience experts, and this is quite possible. We also know that image removal is a critical piece of justice and healing for survivors. It's very difficult to heal uh, if, if your abuse is continuing to be placed online, where anyone can Google your name, your address, your school, and learn everything about your exploitation. Image removal should not be different across different platforms and sites, but what we hear from survivors is they're effectively left to create their own digital rape kit and clean up their own crime scene, and that is an unacceptable standard. Uh, in closing, I wanted to say that we have the will, we have the solutions, and, and our children depend on us. If we address image-based sexual violence for everyone today, there truly will be less child victims tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. There's so much I want to pick up on, but there's, there's, there's literally no time, so we're going to just leave you to have conversations after this gets a mic drop, <laughs> literally. Uh, so thank you for that. I will need to immediately move to the next speakers because, because there is not enough time. We have only 15 minutes left. Um, what I'm gonna move now on towards is the digital innovation ecosystem. That was a question we had from online, but also we just wanna move to discuss a little bit more broadly uh, um, this entire ecosystem. Uh, Salome, I wanna go to you. Uh, you are from the German development agency, GIZ, and you are the director of the Digital Transformation Center in Kenya. GIZ is famous for investing in working in the field of digitization, innovation, cybersecurity, um, and skills. Um, and I'm very curious to hear from you a bit about challenges and opportunities of integrated child online safety into this work across all of these areas, whether that has been done in, 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 uh, successfully so far or what, what are the plans for the future. Uh, but maybe if you can do four minutes. So sorry. <laughs> I'll try my best, Maria. Thank you so much um, for, that, for that question. Um, I'll start with two disclaimers. I'm sitting here as a non-child online protection expert. I'm sitting here as a practitioner who has as a, as a goal to mainstream, to bring in child online protection into our activities. And as you were saying, we, there are many fold, right? They range from, uh, range from digitizing government service to working with the tech ecosystem and tech entrepreneurs, um, SMEs going digital, to, uh, working on a twin transition. And everywhere there are angles around child online protection. Um, and yet, and maybe that's the, the, the entry point I'll, I'll take, um, we have a twofold approach um, in GIZ, how we try to um, work around this question. So the first part of the approach is really that mainstreaming idea. And I like to use the, the image of, of, a, of a braid when you braid the hair. We ideally want to braid in uh, child online safety measures and considerations from the onset um, of a project. And not, and I, I must say we're also guilty of that as GIZ in the past, not adding it as a bow in the end, right, of your, of your braid, but you really have it as per design into um, all of our activities. And the second part of the approach is really genuine child online safety projects um, that focus not only um, on 
integrating and, and mainstreaming the topic into other activities, but generally trying to tackle a certain topic. For instance, um, one of our um, activities that we have jointly also with children, for children, created is an, a set of online training nuggets where uh, children starting from the age to 10 to, to 15 can um, explore how to navigate the online world safely um, in, a, in a very easygoing way. Um, to, and this is an, one of the aspects as well where we try to have that initiative and these um, trainings available in up to 10 languages by now. Also in uh, Kiswahili, for instance, for Kenya, and we saw how important it is as well to translate all these phenomenal tools that we have by now, by ITU, by UNICEF, etc., um, to other languages as well, to make them accessible to all the children around the world um, and youth growing up. Um, so that's the, the twofold approach that we um, are pursuing with, with GIZ at the moment. And now maybe come to your questions around challenges, opportunities, I see. Um, what struck me in your introduction was your point where we were saying, oh, you talk to someone working on infrastructure, and they're saying, oh, that's not about children. You talk about someone uh, to, uh, working on digital skills, and they say, ah, oh, no, no, that's not really what we're doing. Um, reflecting on that, within GIZ, it might be a, a slightly different variation. I would more call it an, a t the attention economy, where I, as a um, practitioner on the ground, I'm interacting with my colleagues, um, that are working in the child protection unit. And they tell me how it is important that we mainstream these, these activities and considerations and safeguards, et cetera. And I, I see the importance. And at the same time, I talk to my colleagues in the gender department, in the climate change department, in the um, disability and inclusion department, et cetera. So in the end, I end up with, I know that all these considerations are so important. And yet my reality on the ground is I have a highly political, high a highly dynamic political environment. I have technological debates that evolve so quickly. I have a limited budget and limited time. And often, um, and maybe that's, that's the, the lessons learned also for myself, I end up maybe going with those that scream the loudest. Or, and maybe that's the positive side, and maybe what, what could be helpful, what has been helpful for me, where I have resources that are easy to use off the shelf. Um, and I don't have to become half of a child online protection expert in order to implement these activities, but it's uh, some tools that I can really use, take, implement. And that has been really helpful for some of the activities that we have been, for instance, on data protection, uh, been able to do, take these, apply them without having to generally become an expert in itself because we're working at a very interdisciplinary level in the end. So that's maybe one of the challenges slash opportunities um, that I see. Um, and okay, then I'll come to the opportunity. That was a challenge. Let me talk about an, uh, an opportunity that I see as well is um, mm, developing agencies, uh, financial um, assistance organizations, et cetera, are setting up bigger and bigger digitalization projects. When I started in GIZ, we had a three million project. That was it. And now I don't even know how much, only the Digital Transformation Center in Kenya is a 30 million project, right? So we are getting bigger and bigger. Um, and I think it's, it's the opportunity as well for us to mainstream in our own frameworks, in our own tools, ways to include these considerations. And something, maybe a best practice that um, I could mention here, we've developed what we call the Digital Rights Check. It's an online tool. It takes you 30 minutes as a practitioner to go through that tool to assess your project either at, uh, at the onset, at project sta uh, uh, design stage or at implementation stage. And that check tells you it's a bit broader. It's about human rights in general, but there's a specific part on child online protection. Tells you exactly, have you thought of X, Y, Z? This is what you could do. These are further resources. These are people you can contact. And that has been va highly valuable to me because I can cater towards all these needs that have the, the, the importance is clearly there, but it kind of meets my daily environment in which I operate. Um, so maybe that's also an opportunity there to have these kind of hands-on tools like the digital rights check um, to, to guide our activities on the ground. Thank you much, so much, Salome, because I think you kind of brought back some reality into the context in terms of lack of resources or, 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 or trying to align all of the resources across, across different agendas. And I think 
when you speak about how do you actually decide what you need to work on, I think I have a perfect answer for you, because there is Matito and Ananya, who are going to tell us a little bit more about USAID's work. Um, but uh, let me just introduce that, introduce that for a minute. So Matito, you are USAID's lead on child protection uh, uh, within the child, uh, Children in Adversity team. And most recently, you have been leading on a cross-agency effort to define USAID's approach and roadmap to digital harms. And I think you found yourself in with a set of premises that you embarked on the process and then you like, switched everything around when you started involvement with, with young people. Um, and I think that's really what I thought was really the most thoughtful thing that USAID could have done is to engage at early stages with young people. Uh, so tell us more about that journey, what you've learned through that journey. Uh, you've established the Youth Digital Council. Uh, Ananya is here who was part of the first cohort and became an advisor afterwards. So I'm gonna give you both six minutes. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> to give us that, please. Thank you so much, and so sorry that this is going to become like a running game. Um, it's first of all, thank you for everyone who is l last point speaking. Good news is a lot of people have said things I've already wanted to say today, so I can zip through my talking points. Um, bad news is that we've lost part of our crowd, so thank you for everybody who has stayed to the very end. You're going to get the best part of the session right now. Um, so I want to thank you for also saying that USAID was thoughtful. We're not always called being thoughtful over here at USAID. You know, we're the, one of the largest development organizations. Um, we're the uh, international branch of the US government. Um, our job is to really, you know, save lives, reduce poverty, strengthen democracy, and get people out of assistance. And so to do that, we've got to be always looking towards the future. Um, and so USAID, USAID came a little late to the party in terms of our digital strategy. It just came out in 2020. It's very comprehensive, it's very robust. I recommend people go online and read it. But when they were developing it, the question came up from our team, the child protection team, where are the children and youth? They are our future, they are gonna be picking up whatever we lay down and they're gonna be driving it uh, as the next generation moving forward. So as the child protection person at USAID, or one of them, but leading in terms of our children and university team, um, they asked me to lead on our digital strategy. Um, I am a field practitioner. I spent 25 years in Africa working with children and youth. I am not a digital person, um, and that ended up being a good thing for reasons I was going to talk about. We'll skip over for the moment. Um, but I said to myself, um, you know, I, how, how, do I, how do I get around my blind spot? How do I really understand the, what, what's happening with you? How do I understand what's going on with a 16-year-old girl online in Brazil? Or how do I understand what's happening with a 12-year-old boy in Ukraine? And so uh, my brilliant idea, which I somewhat stole from Microsoft, I'll give them that nod of credit, was to develop a digital youth council. So at USAID, with our, digital, our youth strategy, we want to work with youth, not for youth. And so that means bringing youth to the table, listening to what they have to say, and incorporating their viewpoint in our strategy and our implementation. So back uh, two and a half years ago, I created a 12-member digital youth council consisting of seven girls and five young men, uh, five young women, six, seven young women, five young men to advise, not only advise us in terms of is our strategy on point, where are we going, but also to build the next generation of change makers, the next generation of leadership. We've had our second year happening now, putting my money where my mouth is, also to make this last part go as quick as possible, I am gonna turn the floor over to Ananya, the voice of the youth, to tell us what was it like working with USAID? What did you see us responding to your voice? And um, how did you feel in terms of the overall process? First of all, thank you very much for inviting me today. Uh, not only is this topic very close to what I'm deeply passionate about, but I've relentlessly worked on this for the past three years. And this session provides us an opportunity to reflect on what some of the best practices in this area have been. And as the youth advisor to the USAID Digital Youth Council, I am very happy to have been invited to shed light on the success story that our council has been. And hence, as I speak, I hope that the story inspires more people to take action for the future with the future. 
As a generation of young people born into the digital age, we understand how digital technologies impact or impair our aspirations and rights. All we need is a platform to be actually heard. Given that digital technology helps to enhance our capacity to engage with and empower the youth, there is no excuse anymore to not reach out and actually seek input from the youth in a more participatory way, treating them as the active and equal partners of digital development as they are. Recognizing this, the USAID, which has for long prioritized positive youth development, established the Digital Youth Council in 2021. I consider it to be my absolute privilege to have been a part of the Digital Youth Council since its very first day. Over the past 2.5 years, the Council has not only served as an important voice in helping to guide the implementation of USAID's digital strategy, but has also helped to raise awareness about digital harms in many countries and influenced national leaders, the private sector, civil society, local communities, and other youth on how best to keep safe while learning, playing, exploring in the digital world. We have co-created and led sessions on innovation, emerging technologies such as machine learning, artificial intelligence, large language models, chat GPT, and try to establish a connection with digital harms which target young uh, children, including our young council members. With the support, training, mentorship, resources and encouragement that we provide through our extremely carefully designed program. Our council members have been able to design apps that educate young people about digital harms through interactive games and other modern features. In fact, one of these apps is about to go live on the Google Play Store by the end of this year. We're also very proud to have involved our young council members in planning and speaking at multiple sessions of the USAID at the Global Digital Development Forum in 2022 and 2023. Personally, I have had the opportunity to speak at the USAID Youth Policy Launch in 2022. The USAID enabled a young person like me to share the stage at, with and ask questions directly to the USAID administrator and the US Congress representatives. I also had the opportunity to MC the USAID's International Youth Day event in 2022, where 1,200 people from across the globe joined us to celebrate young people and engage in a panel discussion on intergenerational solidarity, inclusion, protection, and mental well-being. But our magnum opus, the first virtual symposium on protecting children and youth from digital harms, attracted the attention of thousands of leaders in government, civil society, and private sector. And we organized this in collaboration with Save the Children and Tech Change. This even brought together influential policymakers and our young council members for panel discussions on themes including, but not limited to online harms, hate speech, and cyberbullying. This this symposium helped to further the US government's APCA strategy and USAID's digital strategy. Over time, while we started with a digital strategy that was heavily focused on gender and sexual violence and uh, which targeted children online, the Digital Youth Council assisted the USAID in broadening the array of issues we actively work on to include themes including but not limited to online mental health and well-being, online financial frauds, misinformation, disinformation, fake news, which target children online. One last quick point. So doing this, USAID has translated words into action for, by setting the perfect example of nothing for us without us. Thank you. And as you can see, she makes my life a lot easier because the voice of the youth are, um, by us being able to really provide that platform, we're actually seeing that change start to happen. Um, and we're actually getting it right in terms of where we should be investing US government taxpayer dollars to better protect children and promote youth going forward. Thanks. Thank you so much, Matita and Anya. You've made my job also easier because that was a really perfect closure, closure to this discussion. I do want to thank all the participants. I'll just take two minutes or maybe like one minute to, to try to sum up some of the main takeaways. But I think we all agree and young people tell us that the internet is great. They love it. They like to be online. They like to engage online. It's opening so many opportunities for them. But online and offline worlds are not for them separate. This is just the way that the world is. And we need to make sure that what the rules apply in the online world can be applicable, um, uh, in offline can be applicable in the online world as well. And some things that are gonna help us align across different agendas will be really much more rigorous and strong focus on participation, 
of people who have lived experiences, people, young people who can tell us what the needs are, but also particip participation in terms of really using a vulnerability lens to understand the trends and threats online to make sure that we can, as we are building this great online world, that we can make sure that we are not exacerbating existing vulnerabilities, existing gender divide, existing issues around gender norms and, 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 and toxic masculinity and issues around radicalization and extremism and all other forms of, of uh, expressions of violent behaviors and power dynamics that exist in the online, on, offline world in the online world. And the last thing I want to say is that we have really seen um, and are calling for action in terms of increased investments in this particular field because it is really sorely lacking investment, dedicated investment from both governments but also industry and other players, whether it's investment in, in, in foreign policy goals or investments domestically or investments in internal uh, organizational infrastructure or in frontline services that we all need to have. Um, so with that, uh, 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 I will thank you all for participating in this, in this discussion. I have definitely been too ambitious in terms of the topics we want to cover and people we want to hear, but I'm really grateful that you are all here. I will run to my plane right now, but uh, I will leave you all to chat a little bit more. Hopefully you go for drinks or something. Those who are online, please uh, reach out. We will be happy to, to engage with you. Uh, go on safeonline.global um, and follow us on social media and we will be happy to engage with all of you. And thank you for the session tonight again.